I'm Robert Dakota of Worldviews Media, and I'm here to introduce you to Brian Forrester, who's going to be joining us at the Earth Origins event in April 21st to the 23rd, 2023. And we've got Brian on the line all the way from Peru. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. We just want to introduce you, and one of the questions is, um, how did you get started in, in uh, you know, this research and becoming an author? Well, I've been fascinated by ancient mysterious places all my life. I grew up with National Geographic magazine, and that introduced me to ancient Egypt and ancient Peru and other mysterious locations around the world. And so from that age on, I developed a fascination for ancient mysteries. And how did you end up in Peru specifically? And was that like in the beginning of your travels or did that come later? Uh, my first trip was about 16 years ago. I literally woke up one morning and heard the word Peru whispered in my ear. So I thought, well, what's, what's in Peru? And of course, Machu Picchu's in Peru. So I decided to save up some money and go down to Peru for a month. Then I went back to Canada where I was living and save up more money and then go back down. And then about 14 years ago, I bought a one-way ticket to Peru and I've been here ever since. And you were telling us there's some very mystical places in Peru. What's, well, you were actually saying that you thought perhaps the, uh, the Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Yeah, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku are probably... Uh, they're both the same location. They're just separated by fences, but they're probably the most mysterious place in Peru and Bolivia because whoever did the ancient megalithic construction there only did that work and did nothing else. It looks nothing like any of the work that we see in, for example, ancient Cusco. And are the places like Machu Picchu and Cusco and Saxa Woman Woman, are they built by the same people or are they different peoples? Well, all those locations uh, that you just spoke of, you have two distinct cultures. You have the Inca who were responsible for relatively crude stone construction using clay as a mortar in between the stone. And then you have the older megalithic work that was done by a civilization as advanced, if not more advanced than what we are today. Some of the work that we see could not be replicated, even with all of our modern technology. And Saxa Woman, what do you have any like speculation of what it is or what it what it was? Well, it was used by the Inca as a festival site during major ceremonies. Um, but the stonework was way beyond the scope of the Inca in terms of intricacy, the way that the giant stones interlock, and the fact that some of the stones are 125 tons and were moved from a quarry at least three miles away over very hilly ground. Uh -huh. And White Rock, that's the place where the, the last refuge of the Inca um, could you tell us something about that megalithic stone? Because I know some of the, the other buildings there are much newer. Yeah, it's actually a, a location called Vilcabamba or Wilcabamba. And it was the last refuge of the Inca after the uh, Spanish had conquered Cusco. And so uh, you have a lot of megalithic works there, but the main uh, giant stone that's there is very mysterious used again by the Inca for ceremonial purposes, but it's, you know, probably a thousand or 2000 tons in weight, has very um, precise flat surfaces and sharp corners. So again, the Inca were a Bronze Age culture. They could not have shaped hard stone like that, which is a type of granite. So clearly it was made by a much more older, very advanced civilization. Mm -hmm. And you've gone into the, uh, the rainforest to meet with the Shipibo? 
Yeah, I've been to very, uh, like many different places in the Peruvian um, Amazon. Um, the Shipibo live near a city, modern city called Pucalpa. And that's where I got my uh, email address from. Uh, but also very early on, my wife and I went into the Amazon to meet with these people uh, because we wanted to help them preserve their culture. And so uh, we did, we used to buy some of the thing, the artwork that they would create and would sell it internationally through the internet. Uh, I've lost touch of them recently, but uh, I, as I said, I've been to many different um, places in the, in the Amazon of Peru and also Bolivia. Uh -huh. That's, that's very cool. I, I was in uh, Pucallpa in 2004 and uh, went over to Bolivia at that time too. But I just found Peru is so vastly amazing from Nazca lines, uh, you know, to the Sacred Valley. It's just so spectacular. And one of the, the amazing things is how the hydrology system still seems to be functional. Is that accurate? Do oh, it know? is. The yeah, probably the Inca's greatest accomplishment was the way that they moved water and their agricultural system. Their population at the peak was about 15 million people. And uh, yeah, incredible system of being able to transport water from up to 20,000 feet in altitude down into valleys like the Sacred Valley of Peru by aqueducts and even underground water systems. Uh huh. And one thing that you're known for is studying the elongated skulls. Could you elaborate a little bit on what you found and um, how you got that verified? Sure. Well, um, there's a culture that lived on the, especially on the coast of Peru called the Paracas, which is where I'm at right now. This is where I live. And there was a culture that existed between 800 BC and about 100 AD that had elongated skulls. Of course, most of the elongated skulls are the result of cranial deformation or head binding, but the original population that was there were born naturally with elongated heads. And we've done a lot of DNA testing of them and their ancestors were not from Peru or even from the Americas. It seems that they migrated from the Black Sea um, area of Eurasia. Which, which part are you cut out at the Black Sea? Uh, the Black Sea um, or more or less Eurasia. Uh huh. Wow. How do you, uh, do you have any speculation on how, I mean, I guess there had to be seafaring people do you have any speculation on how they got there? Yeah, I've already, I've actually figured out how they could have migrated by boat from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean and then across the Ameri across the Pacific, to probably to the coast of uh, Ecuador. And then they waited for the prevailing southerly winds to shift and move south and then traveled from, uh, the coast of Ecuador down, they found a large bay called the Paracas Bay that was largely unpopulated. And I believe that that's where they decided to settle because they wouldn't be disturbed by anybody. And over the course of time, they mixed in with whatever the local population was that lived there. And do you, do you think there are other types like do you see the similar uh, types of elongated heads in Egypt or is that a different type altogether? Well, there are depictions of um, elongated heads in Egypt, but I've never seen any physical elongated skulls. So okay. there are depictions of Akhenaten's daughters who appear to have had elongated heads and some show depictions of him as well. Um, but the difference is on the coast of Peru, I've seen hundreds of these elongated skulls. And in some cases, the full skeletons and even skeletons of seven to nine month old fetuses whose heads were the size of their torso. So clearly uh, would have been born with an elongated head. Wow, that's, that's strange. And 
I guess some some people out there would be speculating that these might be extraterrestrials. Um, yeah, we honestly don't know. I'm open to the idea that they could have been, but we don't have any evidence. We simply know that they were not home. We know for sure they were not Homo sapiens sapiens. They were either a sub, probably a subspecies like Homo sapiens paracas. But um, as far as I know, I'm really the only person who has been studying uh, this subject in depth for about 10 years. Academics don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. I guess not. Is there any specific thing that you like about Egypt and what brings you back to Egypt over and over again? Well, again, it's the megalithic works because of the size um, and also the way, again, that the stones interlock with one another. They could not have been achieved by the dynastic Egyptians as we know them. The dynastic Egyptians inherited sites such as the Giza Plateau and renamed, for example, the Great Pyramid and other structures there, and they built their structures alongside or on top of the older megalithic works. So it seems that they had a very advanced culture if they're doing yeah, that they kind had, of architecture. Yeah, they must have had very advanced technology because they were also transporting stone, um, especially granite, as far as 500 miles away from the Swords Quarry at Aswan in the south of Egypt, all the way up to the Giza Plateau and even farther north than that. So how could they have done that? You know, you're talking 60, 80, 100 ton blocks of stone, uh, uh, obelisks that weighed up to 400 tons a piece made out of one piece of stone and giant boxes that have been found underground in tunnels that weigh up to 100 tons a piece. So there's, there's very much the reality of potential that there could be lost technologies that could be rediscovered that could change how we run civilization today. Yeah, I think it would be people are, including Randall Carlson, he's working on rediscovering the ancient technologies and possibly trying to replicate how this technology was created in the first place and replicated to be used now in the 21st century. Yeah, we're going to have the opportunity to hear more about that when he's out here in April. And we'll have you out here then as well, Brian. We're really looking forward to it. Is there anything you wanted to add, Darren, before we close out? Yeah, I just had a couple of questions uh, going back to Saksi Woman. There was a rumors of there being a tunnel that runs from there all the way maybe to the Cori Kancha. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, it's actually been mapped um, by plane. They use ground penetrating radar and they discovered that there is a tunnel that goes from Sakse Waman south down under the center of the Inca, ancient Inca city um, building called the Cori Kancha. And so it has been mapped. And I do know a Spanish archeologist who was the one that was actually allowed in there around 1989. But as soon as he made the discovery, the Vatican declared that that was to be sealed till, until the end of time. So he proved it's there, but nobody after that has been allowed to go back in. Wow, Vatican, interesting. But yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> I was like, Vatican. interesting of all people that would have the so I guess that uh, the Vatican being involved in that leads me to my other question was around, um, you know, if you want to, if you could talk a little bit about what the elongated skulls, I, I, I know from following your work, I believe in the beginning, you tried to send some DNA samples to some universities, and I think you told them what it was for, and then they would basically send it back to you like, uh, yeah, we don't want any part of this. And then if I'm remembering your story correctly, correct me, but I think you then sent them back, but you didn't say who you were and what it was for. And then they kind of came back and, you know, with the evidence and they were like, wait a minute, now they're interested in you. Like, where'd you get this from? Um, well, actually, that's not exactly the case. We actually, we sent some stone samples from Puma Punku to a laboratory in the, in the US and told them what it was and they refused to test it. Um, but in terms of the elongated skulls, our first uh, examination was samples from 18 different skulls. 
and we sent the samples to three different universities without telling them anything about them at all. And two of the universities came back with results. The best one is actually a university in Canada called Lakehead University. They, they did quite an exhaustive analysis and were able to show us that the majority of the maternal or mother's DNA from these elongated skulls did not originate in Peru or the Americas, but closely corresponded with similar ones found near uh, the, or in the Black Sea area of Eurasia. So that's why I drew the connection between Eurasia and Paracas and the skulls that have been found in that area of Eurasia are also exactly the same looking as the ones from Paracas. Interesting. Uh, the last question I had around, uh, so the, the, the polygonal walls that you see in you know, multiple megalithic sites around the world, and then they also, a great many of them have, you know, what they refer to as like the nubs. Do you see when you go to Egypt uh, and maybe other places as well, and then also to Peru, they're very similar, but different. Do you think it was a global culture, but maybe slightly different? Or do you think it was the same groups across the planet? You know, how do you, you know, there, there are definite very differences, but there's also fascinating things that are very much the same but span thousands of miles and oceans apart. Yeah, I think there were probably three, if not four ancient civilizations capable of megalithic work. I think whoever was responsible for the work in Egypt was completely different from the one in Peru because in Egypt, any, everything is very linear. Whereas in Peru, everything is pretty well polygonal or multi-sided interlocking stones. So that's the difference between a left brain approach and a right brain approach. And then when you go to a location like Easter Island, uh, which we touched on a little bit earlier, um, there again, you find that there are, of course are these giant stone heads, which are full bodies with heads called Moai. And you have two different styles. You have ones that are six to eight feet tall with flat noses. And those were probably done or clearly done by the Polynesian people. And then you have other ones which are much bigger with more like European style aquiline noses. And they, you know, they're much bigger and uh, they were most likely done by an older culture that was of transporting huge blocks of stone or figures of stone over, you know, a, at least a few miles. There's one that is still in the quarry that would have weighed 200 tons that was never complete. Um, but there are some around uh, Easter Island that are up to you know 20 feet or 25 feet tall. So I think that's the common theme of all of these ancient locations is you have the culture that we know of that was responsible for some of the work. And then we have the more monumental work that could not have been done by that culture and had to have been done by um, beings or people with much more sophisticated technology and possibly the ability of uh, transporting stone literally through the air rather than moving it across the ground because of the scale we're talking about. Wow. Do you have uh, you know, a few areas that jump out to you, whether in Egypt or Peru, that really show evidence of a cataclysm? I think uh, maybe Tanis might come to mind or some other ones that really stick out to you of something very cataclysmic happened in these locations that you can really see for your own eyes. Yeah, Tanis is located in the Nile Delta in Northern Egypt, and it looks like something exploded there because all the giant stone objects that are there are snapped into pieces as if they were styrofoam. And almost no vegetation can grow there for some strange reason. It's like all the nutrients in the soil was uh, vaporized. And then also in Egypt, on the Western surfaces of some of the ancient structures like at Karnak, uh, you can see that there's vitrification or where the stone was literally turned to glass. So that's also at the Ramesseum, which is near, uh, more or less near Karnak. Um, and then in Peru and Bolivia, there are other locations such as Silustani, where again, on the Western surfaces, you can see that very high heat, like a flash or burst of heat, 
struck and melted the surface of the stone. Wow. 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 Yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty amazing. That's all I got, Robert. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I thought one, of one more question, Brian. Um, in Easter Island, you know, the, um, the Rongo Rongo text mm -hmm. is uh, re somehow related to the Indus Valley. Had you heard that? And do you find any of that in Peru? Uh, no, you don't find it. You find it nowhere except on Easter Island or Rapa Nui. And I had the great fortune of being able to meet one of the elders on the island the last time I went. And I asked him, how far back does humanity go on this island? And he said, how far back do you want to go? And he, al he also said that the, um, the people of the Indus Valley were able to get to Easter Island and they introduced the Rongo Rongo language from there. So there is a direct, according to him, there is a direct connection to it. It's the strange thing about Polynesia. You have you know, all these related culture, like the Hawaiians and the Samoans and the Tongans and the Maori, etc. The only place where you find a glyph language like that is on Easter Island. And the only one relating to it is found in the Indus Valley of India. So obviously there's, there's an ancient connection of some kind. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. I, I could talk about it for a very long time. Uh, we won't keep you any longer. I'm very appreciative of your time, Brian. And uh, we'll put a little trailer together and we'll get this back to you. Okay, great. Thank you. I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for taking the time and uh, having the time, <laughs> extra time. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Okay, we'll stay in touch, Brian, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon.